Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Well, um, we are now $17,000 more in debt. Yeah, well, you know, in all fairness, we had to buy those plane tickets back. But did we really need to fly first class? We could have flown economy. Oh, no, no, no. No way. The economy is terrible. Yeah, he's right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyways, I got his jobs here at the airport. Awesome! Where are we? Honestly, I have no idea anymore. Moving on. I got his jobs here, but the pay sucks. So, new plan. We're going to hawk all this spy stuff that I, um, borrowed. Is that what I've been carrying all this time? Wait, how did we get it all the way back to the States? There's a lot of stuff here. Yeah, I checked it at the airport. The baggage thing. They really let you check two giant trash bags full of stuff? This is a lot. Does it cost extra to check more luggage? I was there with him, Tom. We use like airline points or something. Where's my credit card? Um, Whatever, we have to sell all of this. Yep, yeah, most of this stuff is damaged. And I think this bag here is literally a bag of garbage. Speaking of garbage, what's going on with the jobs here? I thought you said you got us jobs. I mean, how did you even get us jobs? We just arrived and I already need a drink. I'll be back. Whatever, um, okay, um, Dan, some of this stuff looks pretty fancy. It's shiny, I don't know. We should probably test some of it, maybe we can get more money out of it. All right, then, uh, first step, uh, hey, let's try this vacuum cleaner that I snagged on the way, have you borrowed on the way out? Yes, borrowed. How do I plug it in? I don't see the plug. I don't know, where's the cable? Is, here, let me, is it under, hang on, is it underneath? Oh. I'm not seeing it. I don't... Like no, 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 hang on, hang on, I think it's one of those wearable vacuum cleaners. See, look at the straps. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. And I'll just, uh, put it on. Oh, that's... See here, this thing is really heavy, and... How do I turn it on? Turn Wait. around. Uh, uh -huh. oh, here's the button. Hang on. Yeah, it's like right here. How are you supposed to reach this? This makes no sense. It's not working. Why isn't it working? Dan, why did you yeah, back, 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 back up, no, back up, back up, back up. I think I see what's going on here. So you see this little thing? That's where it's supposed to put the fuel. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to fly it over here if it was full. Oh, yeah, those liquid laws and stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, good thing we're at an airport. I'm just going to run over here and get some gas. There we go. Just pour some fuel in here. Normally, at this point, I'd be questioning why a vacuum cleaner needs fuel. All right, we're full. Sorry, I spilled a little on you there, Dan. But no, um, of course. Okay. Let's try it out. Aren't you guys supposed to put in the hose first? You know, yeah. Where's the hose? Who cares? Click. <laughs> okay, I don't know if it was supposed to do that, but now there's a huge hole in the wall over there. And now it's on fire. You all right there, Dan? Mm. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Are you troubled by a strange Sylvester Stallone in Demolition Man in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of Grandel Bush in Maniac Cop 3 in your basement? Or Robert Davi in License to Kill in your attic? Have you or your family ever seen a spook, Spectre, or Timothy Dalton in The Rocketeer? If you've ever followed Joe Polito into The Crow, then don't wait another minute. Pick up the phone and call the professionals. Ernie Hudson in Ghostbusters Afterlife. We're ready to believe you. This is it. The final chapter of Season 2 of The Fire Pit. The Marshmallow Man March to the Afterlife. Step on through to the other side at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh take you towards the podcast's final and inevitable resting place. Ghostbusters Afterlife. It spooks, specters, ghosts, and it's here every Tuesday at The Fire Pit. We're ready to believe you. 
Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, British named Nigel, and we welcome you to yet another exciting and adventurous episode as we continue our Marshmallow Man march to the afterlife. So far, we've knocked frozen heads off, outlasted zombie cops, and went rogue against the British government. We can't wait to see what's in store for tonight. Now, as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them onto this one. So, to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, I'll send things over to Tom. Thank you, Dan! Tom here, British name Thompson, and last time out we watched Timothy Dalton run down Robert Darby as the one and only Bond, James Bond, in 1989's License to Kill. And tonight, we'll follow 007 as he goes from secret British agent to secret Nazi agent in 1991's The Rocketeer. Now, to give us a bit more of a rundown and some box office numbers, I send things over rocket style to Josh. Whoosh. Ah, thank you, Tom. Josh here, British name Reginald. And as mentioned above, we're watching The Rocketeer tonight, starring one Timothy Dalton, Bill Campbell, Alan Arkin, and a Jennifer Connelly. The movie that wanted to launch a franchise, but ultimately didn't, but is still kind of a cult classic and quite remembered quite fondly. Quite. That was reader error, by the way, not script error. Quite. Let the record show. Quite. Tom, edit that out. <laughs> Quite. Release date of June 21st, 1991. Running time of 108 minutes. Had a budget of about $35 million and a box office of about $46.7 million. Oof. Oof. And that was probably before they counted the advertising revenue. Unless they didn't advertise, in which case that explains the... Uh, how much it made but like i said um released june 21st 1991 it was its widest release was 1903 theaters and it ran for about 27 weeks its opening weekend it premiered at number four do you guys care to take a whack at what was number one on its second week of release i know i know i know i know i know okay Um, tom the senator from ohio um defers to the other senator from ohio you can't do that tom I object. That is wrong. But so 1991, I'm trying to remember what was out in 1991. I'll give you one hint. We've seen it on this podcast. That narrows it down to about uh, almost 80 films. Um, uh, Batman 2. In 1991. Die Hard 2. Go ahead and tell him, Dan. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Oh, my God. Oh, shit. I was sick yes, for that Robin movie. Hood Prince of Thieves was on its second week of release. It pulled in $18.2 million. At number two that weekend was City Slickers playing in $10.7 million. At number three, on its also opening this weekend, was Dying Young pulling in $9.7 million. And number four was The Rocketeer pulling in $9.6 million. And at number five, was Backdraft on its fifth week of release, pulling in $4.5 million. I know every one of those movies except Dying Young. That yeah, same really here. That's the only one. That whole, we rattle off all those movies, and I've not seen Dying Young. That's the only one I've not seen. And and what, was that its opening weekend too? Or was yep. how many, and it beat The Rocketeer? That movie? Yeah. Dying Young. I need to look that one up because I'm a bit curious. But continue your... Looks like a, uh, oh, it's a Julia Roberts film. It's a, it's a, it's a romance. Uh, okay. Yeah. Other notables in the box office though, was at number six was jungle fever. Uh, what about Bob at number seven? One movie that we have to get to at number eight, pulling in $2.8 million was don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. I've seen that film. Kid Me loved that film. Same. Kid Me loved that film, too. That's the movie where I learned what the term petty cash was. Yes, and I learned that embezzlement will always, always solve problems. Yes, yes. At number 10 was Thelma and Louise on its fifth week of release, pulling in $2.6 million. And on its 32nd week of release, at number 12, was Home Alone. At number 13 was Silence of the Lambs. And at number... 14 was Kindergarten Cop. Wow, that's a lot of, like, not all of those are good movies, but almost all of those are memorable movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. they may not be in everybody's DVD collection, but 
you've got at least one or two of those movies. Or you've yeah. seen all of them. Yeah, even you've seen you all of them. them yeah. Even if you don't own them, you've probably seen all or most of these films. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's it seemed like a very interesting uh, weekend at the box office. Once again, proving our point that the years between 1988 and 1993 were really good times to go to the movies. Yeah. But uh, like I said, on its fifth week release, The Rocketeer had dropped to number 12 in the box office. Mm-hmm. At number one on its third week of release was Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And at number two was premiering Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Wow. A couple of those have been on her uh, watches. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So 91, I think we talked about that during Bill and Ted and or Terminator. That's a year with a bunch of movies. Like not the best we've seen. I think 89 was probably one of the best years for movie movies we've covered. But this is definitely a. Uh, a contender. 91 is definitely a contender. You're, you're talking Home Alone and Terminator 2, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. The, of course, tonight's movie, The Rocketeer, which I know wasn't a huge smash hit, but, you know, I liked it as a kid. Silence um, of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. You know, those are some pretty big movies. Hell, even Thelma and Louise. That's like one of those you have to watch films. That's a stone cold classic film. Yeah, especially like, you know, uh, it's got like young... I think that's one of Brad Pitt's very first roles. Yeah, yeah, I think that was. That was. I know yeah. I know it's it was... not his very first, but it's like one of his earliest roles. So it's like Man. I just pulled up the box office for like the year nineteen ninety one. Dances with Wolves came out with that that year too. Yeah. Oh so, shit. Wow. Ninety one was no slouch for the box office for movies. For your Star Trek <laughs> reference, that was that year which Star Trek was released, Nigel? Uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Take a drink. Holy shit. I thought it was like 94. No, 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 no. Because 1991 is when the Berlin Wall came down. And that's the the whole point or the whole storyline of Star Trek VI is, is an entire allegory for Perestroika and the fall of the Soviet Union and the USSR and all that stuff. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, man, I remember yeah. that being later, but you're right. That was 91. Wow. Overall, it was a good year for movies. That's for damn sure. Yeah, well, I don't cause... think the Berlin Wall had come down, but definitely Perestroika was going through the USSR. And USSR was going through major reforms with Mikhail Gorbachev and all that. That was the point of Star Trek V. It's a whole allegory yeah. for that exact moment in time. Which hopefully we do watch that film at some point, because that'd be a great conversation. Yes. But that was about uh, USSR. Tonight we get to talk about Nazis. So, um, Nigel, do you have any trivia about that? Not Nazis, the movie. Yeah, I don't have any trivia about Nazis. Really, not much was known about them. Anyways, so... Especially in the 1930s. Yeah, I, I know that Indiana Jones fought them. That's about it. <laughs> uh, I do have a little bit of trivia on this film. Um, last week, we we watched James Bond, License to Kill, starring our connector tonight, Timothy Dalton. Well, there's a scene in the movie uh, during the, uh, the fight on board the Zeppelin uh, where someone says to Neville Sinclair, where's your stuntman now, Sinclair? To which uh, Neville replies, I do all my own stunts. This line was actually a reference to Timothy Dalton's time as James Bond, since he was known for being one of the only Bond actors to perform most, if not all, of his own stunts in his films. No kidding. I yeah. wondered why some of those action scenes seemed tamer than usual, because they didn't want to kill Timothy Dalton. Yeah. Okay. So, um... The uh, plane flown by uh, Cliff in the beginning of the movie, uh, the GB racer was actually nicknamed the Widowmaker or the Flying Coffin because it was incredibly difficult to fly and was very prone to crashing. But because of its speed and maneuverability, a lot of pilots still raced it despite the danger. It was all engine, though. That was like the equivalent of the 1930s equivalent of like driving a car that was just one giant engine with an axle. (laughs) Pretty much. Pretty much. And also, like, people, I, you know, most of our audience is not old enough, including us, is not old enough to remember this particular time in America. But pilots back then were like rock stars. They flying. were. I mean, because aviation was very young. So they were making giant leaps in technology, aviation technology, every six months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, the Widowmaker came out, and that was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. But that was just literally like them putting a propeller and wings on the biggest engine available. Yeah. Practically an Acme rocket. To put it in perspective, and as far as war frames go, we went from in the, the very beginning of the 1900s of having no planes in wars to the very end of the 1900s having jet fighters in wars. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. If it, you want to put it in the broad yeah. scheme of things, I mean, it, what, airplanes, late 1800s, early 1900s, six years later, rockets to the moon. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, but 
pilots in the 1930s, which is when this movie takes place in the 1940s and, and all that. And then after World War II was over, pilots in the fit. We actually saw this in the right stuff. Mm-hmm. We watched at the very beginning of this podcast in its wee early days um, when we watched the right stuff. We watched um, pilots that were rock stars, you know, guys like Chuck Yeager and all. They were household names at the time. Connected um, universe. Oh, yeah. It's all connected. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Looks Definitely. like the conspiracy board. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and as Josh alluded to last week, Joe Johnson's work on this film is what actually led to him being hired as director of Captain America, the first Avenger. 20 years later in 2011 or I'm sorry, almost 30 years later in 2011. I'm wondering. No, 20 years later. Yeah, My bad. It was 20 years I was later. saying, no, I'm thinking of right now. It's 2021. I'm like, no, wait, no, Dan, 2011 was 20 years later. So yes, 20 years later, he's hired as, as the director of captain America, the first Avenger. You think the guy that hired him was like one of those kids that had seen it and was now in a position. It's like, wait a minute. You made The Rocketeer. I love that movie. You get to make Captain America now. I mean, seriously, if you look at The Rocketeer, I mean, uh, the, what the one thing that it's like praised for is its period accuracy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Minus The Rocket Pack, obviously. And like, he did a fantastic job of just capturing the 30s in film, but I don't mm-hmm. want to step all over Tom's toes. Oh, no, no, no. No toes stepped on. <laughs> and also in uh, Connected Universe land, Frank Darabont did uncredited work on the screenplay of this film. So Connected Universe with Walking Dead and Green Mile and Shawshank Redemption confirmed. Oh, Ooh. he is just one of those guys that's in everything. Holy God. And I've got some other um, trivia, but actually a lot of what I have to talk about involves certain scenes of the movie, like some of the special effects used to make the rocket pack and uh, some of the cuts they had to make because of the budget and some of the um, uh, like set pieces they used. So um, I'll have some more stuff to talk about as the movie goes on. But um, Tom, what about uh, your production well there's a bit of production stuff going on here so let me rock it into it with the rocketeer tagline an ordinary man forced to become an extraordinary hero summary young pilot cliff played by billy campbell stumbles onto a prototype jetpack that allows him to become a high-flying masked hero general history on this one this is actually based on the comic book character, The Rocketeer, uh, which was uh, created by Dave Stevens for Pacific Comics, uh, specifically um, in the back pages of Star Slayer and a pair of their Pacific Presents uh, back in 1982. Obviously, this is a comic book company that did not last very long out of the 80s. And much like its comic inspiration, The Rocketeer is meant to be a high-flying action throwback f- to the old serials like Flash Gordon. Also like Flash Gordon, this was kind of a cash grab. Um, Specifically, as noted earlier, this was a desperate effort by Disney to get their own franchise film like Indiana Jones or Star Wars. A bit of irony in that, right? Eventually, they just decided to buy them. Like, why are we trying to beat them? We'll buy them. Although this would uh, serve as a prototype for what would be their um, formula that they would use in the MCU. But honestly, let's uh, be honest. This was the strategy Hollywood studios uh, used pretty religiously back in the 80s and 90s. Stop me again if you've heard this one. This is a movie with a proven but cheap director, dime store writers, and a collection of fresh and cheap new coming actors and actresses surrounded by seasoned but also cheap character and professional actors and at least one named actor to bring an anchor. So you're like, oh, I know that guy. But thankfully, unlike uh, Flash Gordon, this was actually helmed by people who kind of knew what they were doing for the production team who were known for making hit films. Charles Gordon, Lawrence Gordon, and Lloyd Levin. Um, We might have heard these guys before. They've done two movies that we've seen on this podcast. Die Hard 2 and Predator 2. They've also done Die Hard 1 and Predator 1. So again, they knew what they were doing, you know, how to make a film that would bring butts in the seats and make it a fun romp for the family. And to help them out, they got Joe Johnson, who 
now we know as director of Captain America, the first Avenger. This was actually not his first time in a film where someone whipped Nazis into shape. Can you guess what film he helped make? Well, I'm going to say this? you said whipped in Nazis, so I'm going to assume either one Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark. It is Raiders of the Lost Ark. He worked on visual effects in that film. He also did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So again, Disney knew what he could do and said, hey, give this a go. But also, he was a young and up and coming director, so also came in cheap. Yeah, this was only his second film, though, wasn't it? It's only his second film. I think it was only his second film, yeah. Yeah, and I've got some other thoughts on another reason why they probably picked him to be the director, but I'll save that for my expectations. But speaking of expectations, if you're going to make a movie about a hero, you're going to need people who can write heroes. And they brought in two people who knew how to write heroes, Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo, who raced to the challenge while writing everyone's favorite 90s superhero TV show that totally wasn't trying to capitalize on the Michael Keaton Batman. Want to guess what that show was? Batman. The Flash. It was the oh 90s God, Flash. So I I liked that show as a kid. So did too. I. Yeah, I thought it was a It's another one I don't want to watch as an adult because I loved that movie as a kid. I actually own, owned it on DVD and, and and honestly the pilot episode absolutely rips a line right out of the Batman movie. 89 Batman movie. And he's like, "You made me." I'm like, "Wait." No, that's from Batman. It was the 90s. I mean, what can you expect? But apparently they could expect good things from these writers. Like, hey, we need you to write a superhero movie. And you're cheap. Not a surprise there. And again, we go in front of the camera. We've got Billy Campbell, Jennifer Connelly, and Timothy Dalton as your big names. The big three. Timothy Dalton, everyone's third or fourth favorite James Bond, swashing and buckling into the role of Neville Sinclair, serves as the known quantity and slash British stage actor playing the villain of the movie, uh, which we would eventually see in future MCU movies. Jennifer Connelly, who we know from Labyrinth, hot love interest Jenny, and conventionally attractive for his time, Billy Campbell, playing the heroically hunky but still man-child protagonist Cliff, and also serving as our obligatory Star Trek connection as the outrageous O'Connor. I did not know he played O'Connor. Oh, well, you he didn't? Might have oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's, yeah, I knew that. I did not know that. I remember um, the guy playing O'Connor being a lot older, like really scraggly, no, he like just, he, he has 40s just, or something. He has, he has just a basically in the episode, he's got a scruffy beard and he has his hair long and then it's in a ponytail. So, But again, obligatory Star Trek connection. Take a drink. And, of course, rounding out this cavalcade of monkeys and ringleaders, you've got your character actors, Paul Zorvino as the gangster Eddie Valentine, Terry O'Quinn as Howard Hughes. So we've got a pretty good, solid group of people coming in to make this film, even though it was an absolute cash grab. Now that we know what went into making this film, um, Nigel, what are you expecting from this film now that we're... How, how, what number of watch throughs is this going to be for you now? Oh, geez. Going back to childhood, maybe a million. I don't know. I wore the hell out of the VHS tape with this when I got it on VHS when I was a kid. Um, now kid me loved it. Adult me has seen it and still likes it, but I've never watched it with a critical eye, which is what I'm going to do tonight. But I think what I'm expecting to get out of it is you kind of mentioned it in your production. I'd always heard rumor that, that Disney would eventually use this film as kind of their template. For the MCU. I'm, I'm going to look for tonight some MCU prototypes. Because yeah. the MCU does have a formula. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But mm. the MCU does have a formula. Oh yeah. And I can't argue too much against it because it makes buckets of money. Critics yeah. are trashing the hell out of the current movie The Eternals. And it's still making bank. So whatever they're doing, it's working. But that's what I'm going to expect tonight. I want to see some early MCU kind of stuff. Even though this is a decade and almost two decades before Disney would own the MCU. Mm -hmm. So 17 years before Iron Man. Yeah. And, but, and, but Disney didn't buy them until right before Avengers came out. Yeah. So, that was 2000. Was that 2011 or 12? 12. Cause next year I think it was 12. Cause yeah, it came out. This, they bought Marvel the same year Avengers came out. Yeah. So, cause the, the Thor, Captain America and Iron Man sequels, Iron Man three, Cap two and Thor two were actually 
being made before Disney bought them. The first one that was actually a Disney product was Avengers Age of Ultron. Anyways, I just I'm kind of looking to look for some early MCU kind of like prototype stuff tonight. That's what I'm expecting. But I'm I'm looking forward to having fun. I think we're going to have fun watching this film tonight. I think it's still a decent film, but ding, what about you, Tom? Um god. When was the last time I saw this? I think high school was when I last saw it on DVD or VHS. And it'd been like the I'd only seen it once or twice or a couple times on the Disney Channel as a kid when I didn't see it in theaters. Um, but I recently uh, saw um, Red Letter Media touched on Rocketeer and did like a review of it. So it refreshed my memory on the movie and, you know, kind of stoked my fires of excitement for watching this again, because I remember this being a fun film. Again, my association with this film, my memory actually, is when I saw this when my aunt was going to college at um, Ohio Northern. I was staying with her, just kind of hang out with her while she was up there in the campus. The memory's starting to fuzz together. I don't know if it was that day we saw it or if it was the next morning. I'm going to say the next morning after we saw the film. She was like, a co-coach or like a um, team manager for the basketball team. And she had got a call at five in the morning or something like that. Something stupid early. And apparently um, a few of her, the people on her team had um, gotten drunk and were trying to make homemade waffles. They didn't have the bottom part of the waffle maker. So they tried to make them on top of the burners on the oven. So my fond memory of watching this film, which involves explosions, is also going with my aunt at god-awful early in the morning to review the burnt-out corpse of this team member's apartment. No one died, thankfully. And just walking... Not for lack of trying. Seriously. (laughs) But this charred, burnt-out husk of an apartment and on the stove which is barely black and steel singed charred hardened remains of what were going to be ohio northern waffles so so they just poured the batter on the burner and used the top part of the waffle press to push down and this is the brightest of the that generation (laughs) it was i know it's not about the movie itself but Rocketeer is now associated in my mind with drunken college stupidity. Josh, what are you thinking about this film as we go into it? Oh, you know how you guys have fond memories and like severe nostalgia when we were watching Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. Yes. Um, this is that movie for me. Oh, okay. Or that's this movie for me. I loved this movie when it came out. I watched it on repeat, probably to my parents' ire. (laughs) I was the kid who was running around in my backyard with a piece of plywood strapped to my back and like solo cups pointed down as the rockets. I had a makeshift helmet. I still love it to this day. And that might be a pure nostalgia drive. I think we talked about a little bit in our last episode, Mm -hmm. but nostalgia is a hell of a drug. Absolutely love the first Avenger. That is my favorite MCU movie. Like, it's one of those things, too, where it's like, I'll hear arguments for Winter Soldier is the best Captain America film, Iron Man is the best, whatever. First Avenger is my favorite. And I remember thinking one day after I finished watching that movie, that uh, that end scene when the kid's holding the trash can shield running off, and I'm like, man, this feels like The Rocketeer. I want to watch The Rocketeer. Yeah. (laughs) And I went and watched The Rocketeer, and then I'm all like, oh my God, it's directed by the... Because, you know, every time I I watch a movie, I load it up on IMDb. Um, I saw it's like Joe Johnston did The Rock... Or this one. What else did he direct? Oh my God, that makes so much sense. You can actually spot the exact moment in this movie where Disney... Or not Disney execs, where at the time Marvel execs who own the MCU hired Joe Johnston for this film. And that's right before he goes off to... fight Sinclair in the in the blimp. Oh yeah. And he goes oh, yeah. he, he runs up to that well lit American flag and tucks that revolver into his Oh holster, my god, yes. And then looks up into the sky and hits the rocket and flies off in front of the American flag and Valentine the gangster goes, "Go get him, kid." And I'm like, that's the exact moment they're like, "That's our guy. Get him for Captain America." <laughs> so- oh yeah, like oh my god, this movie, uh it was on like I said it was on repeat. I have so much nostalgia for this movie. I I've said this joke before, but it's holds true for this film. Milk tastes better coming out of a rocketeer glass. 
<laughs> that's how much I like The Rocketeer. So uh, it's a, it's one of those movies too where it's like I kind of forget how much I love that movie. Mm-hmm. But it's like when I saw it come up on my list, I'm like, okay, this is my list. This is the one I'm going to push for. And it's like it's come up in the past, and I've wanted to watch it. And it's like I'm really glad we're able to watch it tonight. I've been super excited to watch this all week, and I have super high expectations for tonight. And I hope that um, your objective viewing renders your nostalgia as fueled as mine. I, I don't think I'm going to be, you know, come up with this like with the Bond film, um, License to Kill, being all like disappointed in it. I again, it's solidly made film i remember and i was recently refreshed on why this was such a good film when i first saw it so i know josh i think your my opinions and your nostalgia are pretty much going to still be well taken care of on this watch yeah like it's i know this movie uh you said cheap director or whatever but i honestly think joe johnston is one of those directors who's going to like what is it sam raimi with the low budget He's solid director. Like if I remember mm-hmm. some of the campiness, like being in the effects, the special effects, I mean, it was 91 at the time when this came out. Like, I think he really does a great job of pulling great performances out of his actors. I can't say that there isn't a Joe Johnston movie. I don't like because he did direct uh, Jurassic park three and Wolfman. And Never watched it. So I can't comment. It's, it's, it's bad. It's very bad. I mean, they screwed up Benicio Del Toro as being the Wolfman. The man doesn't even need makeup. He just, he is the Wolfman. That was a movie with Benicio Del Toro and Anthony Hopkins, and it was boring as hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I blame the editing on that one, but we can talk more about that one. Yeah, more. let's get to that one someday, but yeah. Yeah, but That'll honestly, but- I mean, you talk about nostalgia poisoning. The more we watch these films, and this is something I was saving, uh, uh, alluded to earlier um, watching these films more and more is it can, it kind of I know I'm going to enjoy this film, but there's still that cynical part of me that just keeps getting poked every time I look at the production. And I see especially films I really liked or really remember enjoying and just seeing in the background, like the pattern of, OK, they picked this guy. He did really nothing before they did this movie. So it was probably because he was cheap. And then you have all these actors and actresses. They're young. They're also cheap. you got one or two people who know what they're doing. And more to the point, with this one, I mentioned that this was the start of the Disney format. There's truth to that. Before this film, if, do you mind if I um, throw down some um, movie like history and such? At this point, just real quick. Yes, yes, I do. Well, I'm doing it anyways. Remember the movie <laughs> Dick Tracy? Yes, I know of it. Yes, I've never watched it. Uh, I, Kid Me loved that, but that was directed by Warren Beatty, who had a very unique vision for that film. So much so that he went well over time and well over budget. And much like this movie, it was supposed to be a tentpole film. And the aftermath of that film. Uh, The Disney executives, Michael Eisner and a couple others, basically wrote a memo, which would outline, and this I got from um, Patrick H. Willems' uh, YouTube. Uh, He did a bit of history on um, Dick Tracy. But basically they said, do not hire directors you cannot control because this shit happens. And now we still see that today where they have these, like you have these directors, like the recent one, The Eternals. Uh, they come out, she, uh, I can't remember her name, but she had a really good indie film. It was like lauded and they picked her to do Eternals. And yes, she was excited to do it, but she was also easy to control. And it's it just disappoints me too to see some of these other films. Like it, they picked them because they they didn't have enough clout to say no to the studio. And that is not going to impact my watching of the film, but it's still, it's going to sour it just knowing that in the background. I don't know if that does for yeah, you I guys. I can kind of see that. I, can, I, I see what you're saying, especially for like newer big budget films, but this movie had a budget of $35 million. I don't, I think they were hoping for a franchise, but I don't think that it was such a big IP that the studio would have really had a care. Like remember the RoboCop remake in 2014? No. And we won't. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I want to not remember it, but like yeah. that director was his name, Jose Padilla, Padilla, 
he he made a couple really big hits in his country and they wanted to bring him over here to do RoboCop. And he had a shit ton of ideas. And I remember reading stuff saying that he would give, he would send in like six ideas and they would send back uh, rejections for all six and three other things that he needed to add. RoboCop was a bigger IP and he didn't get to make the movie he wanted to make. Same thing with Dave, David Ayer in uh, the Suicide Squad, the original one, mm-hmm. not the Suicide Squad, but just Suicide Squad. He said that the movie that they released was not the movie that he made. Like to a degree, I I can understand your criticism, but given the the Rocketeer was not a big IP, it did not have a big budget. Like the Terminator Two had like over a hundred million dollar budget for nineteen ninety one. I don't think that that this would really be would bleed into that easy to control cheap. Yes, but I don't think they gave a care about control. I think this would be one of those movies where they're like, we're going to let him do what he wants to do. And as long as he doesn't totally screw it up, we're going to be good. Yeah. And like, and I I understand Tom's memo too. the whole, you know, don't hire directors you can't control. But there's a another reason for that. And it's not because Disney are dicks and they have to control everything. It's because also like if you look at. Warren Beatty and Dick Tracy, the movie went off budget and went off the rails and it fucking bombed and it was awful and it was lambasted by critics and absolutely slayed in the press. And oh, some of that is because, you know, if you're not controlling the director and he goes off budget and he goes off script and he goes completely crazy and now you've lost a ton of money. And at the end of the day, it's a business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No one's going to stay open for too long if you keep hosing out movies that aren't making any money. So, it did make money, though. It just wasn't as big a blockbuster as they thought. But it was slayed by critics. Like, it was destroyed by critics. And I've seen that movie recently. It's bad. It's really bad. But I, I and I kind of understand what they're doing. And I and like I, I think the biggest example of the MCU falling or arguing with a, a director that wouldn't fall into line, I guess, for lack of a better term, would be Edgar Wright with Ant-Man. I was and just going to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that is because Edgar Wright was insistent that Ant-Man be a standalone film. And Marvel and then later Disney correctly told him, no, this MCU is making too much money for you to experiment with one of our IPs that we're now going to, that is now worth a million dollars. If if you were making Ant-Man in 1990, fine, but you're making Ant-Man in 2000 in, when did Ant-Man come out? 2016, 2015, 2015, wow, 2015 long ago. Yeah. Wow. If you were making Ant-Man in 2005, they probably would have given him more leeway and said, okay, it doesn't need to be connected. It's 2015. Now the MCU is a thing. It's making a ton of money. It needs to be in the MCU. And Edgar Wright was like, I'm not going to put it in the MCU. And they're like, okay, fine. Then we're going to go find another director. You're fired. Yeah, but pretty much. Yeah, but there's it goes so far as like they bringing these directors like you don't have to worry about the action scenes or anything else like that. We've already filmed those. Just make the film work around the action pieces. It's we we got this. You're just here to say, hey, we got this director. Right. See, they're indie. You this will be good, even though look and act the same in all of them. It's cookie cutter. There's a process. The Marvel cinematic way. I I get that. It, it ceases to be art and just becomes the, the you know, just cookie cutter. Yeah, but the process. But I do think that that's why the good MCU movies um overshadow the, the bad ones or the, the more cookie cutter ones is when I think the Coen brothers do a really good job with uh, the Captain America films and Avengers and or they did they did Infinity War and Endgame. You know, I think they do a Russo good Russo brothers. Russo brothers. Russo. Yeah, Russo. Coen yeah, brothers. Coen. Coen, <laughs> Coen brothers do no country. Oh my god, I'd love to see a Coen brothers man Marvel movie. Um, oh my god, please. <laughs> Not the same Coen who did Garfield though. No, 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 no. The Coen brothers, like No Country for Old Men. Coen brothers. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Uh, Disney talks to uh, or Disney talk to us, and we'll get these guys. We'll get the Coens on the on the board. Yeah, but yeah, well, I think now at this point we're talking more about the mouse than we are about the rocketeer so we know what so i you know uh, you go, go josh no you go sir no you go no you go you know i cut you off you go <laughs> well speaking of being cut off Tom, on play the music Welcome back to another death-defying episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and stuntman, Tom! Okay, so wait, 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 wait. He does his own stunts. Oh. 
Well, this is kind of awkward now. Um... <clears throat> and thank you for stunning it up, I guess, with us here at the fire pit. Now that we've come back from our holiday mini break, we're more than ready to do our own stunts on our Marshmallow Man march into the afterlife, flying off tall heights and crashing into crash mats from movie four and towards some more on our way to the season finale, Ghostbusters Afterlife. We're going to be taking a brief hiatus once we finish this season, but we'll be starting things off with a Q&A and retrospective episode, respectively, before jumping right into season three. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask us, whether it's about this second season, the previous first season, the upcoming third season, or about the show as a whole, you can put them in a comment in Discord, or you can email them to us directly at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. You still have two or three weeks to get them in, so whatever you want to know, you still have time to give it a go. So, let us know. And speaking of giving it a go, let's see how hawking off illegally obtained top secret equipment is going for our team. Well, I think that's the fastest we've been fired from a job. Whoa, well, if you think that's fun, guess what? We now owe an additional $6,000 in damages. Who wants a high five? High five. I honestly don't know what their problem was. Fires and explosions happen all the time at airports. Yeah, I mean, seriously, if they fired someone, no pun intended, every time that something like that happened, they wouldn't have anybody to work there. I mean, come on. You are absolutely correct. Now, let's sell more of this junk. Uh, yeah, let's, I got this, um, look at this weird pen thing here. I'm just... Hey, 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 shut up, Tom. Those two guys over there, they seemed interested in us. Very professional with black suit and sunglasses at night. You know what I'm thinking? Let's sell them a vacuum cleaner, Nigel! All right. Hello, sir. You're looking quite prim and proper this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm Agent Valentine, and this is my partner, Agent Sinclair. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Are you familiar with Reginald Nigel Thompson? Nope, never heard of him. But now we'd like to ask you a question. Do you have trouble keeping those fine black suits dander-free? No. But if you have any information, they're wanted for theft of Allied Nation equipment. We'd appreciate any information. If we remember anything, we'll definitely give you a call. Are either of you interested, by the way, in a very special whole house vacuum cleaner? <laughs> no, no, thank you. Um, look, here's my card. If you remember anything, do give us a call. No problem. We have minds like steel traps, just like our vacuum cleaner. Wait a minute, what's that on your back? That kind of looks like a rocket Technology! Pack. Like our technology we're looking for. Can't help you with that. That's a vacuum cleaner. But I'll tell you something. We think you'll fall in love. Give us 15 minutes, we'll change your life. Trust me. Um, unless you like living in filth. Come on, who wants to see this thing suck? No, no thanks. I, um... <laughs> I already own one, yes. Yeah, I, I just remembered uh, we have an urgent appointment we gotta get to, so we appreciate your time. Well, if you change your mind, uh, we'll happily provide a free demonstration. Let's get out of here, come on. And they're gone. God damn it, Josh, you just had to go and make it weird. You're the one who was like, oh, roll around in your filth. Come on, dude. You're both idiots. This sale was a lock until you opened your mouths. You know what, Dan? I don't think that's a vacuum cleaner. Say what? Yeah, I mean, seriously, what makes you think that? Yeah, tr turn over here. Right here on the side, this label says MI6 rocket pack prototype serial H-U5H35. Probably explains why it doesn't have any hoses and runs on fuel. You know what? That explains so much. I don't think I want this on my back anymore. Hang on a second, hang on a second. I wanna, I wanna click. Yeah! Ooh. It went a little higher that time. I don't think he's moving. He's fine. Oh, I know I see him moving. Oh, yeah, told you. I'll be at the bar. Dan, you want anything from the bar? Nice. I sure hope they stole the helmet on the way out, too. 
Ooh. But if you want to steal some time with us on an episode to talk about one of your products, or if you want to steal a moment to shout out someone special, or if you want to steal our ears and talk about whatever tickles your fancy, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as why you're emailing. Whether it's to buy some ad space, ask for us to make space for a movie recommendation, give your opinion about a movie that we've already watched, or maybe decided not to watch, or whatever else you think should come our way, and give us your two bits. From there, we'll read it. Steal it away from a billionaire aeronautical philanthropist, hide it away in an airplane hangar while evading Nazi spies, Italian gangsters, and the FBI, and never respond. Whoever found it wound up turning it over to the police pretty much the instant they found it, who then turned it over to the FBI right away, because that's how common sense works. I mean, seriously. Stolen government property. People are going to find out about that. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C. Capital C. Capital E. Capital I. At gmail.com. That looks like a pretty long fall off that step, the boss! Guess I should come in and... Oh, oh, oh! Oh no? Take two. Still gonna do it yourself. Okay. Well, I guess I'll keep waiting here in case they'll need me to fall off something dangerous. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck! Would've been nice to have a stuntman for that scene, wouldn't have? And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. You know, the 30s was pretty cool without that whole depression thing going on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or that looming Nazi threat in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Or Japan destroying the South Seas. And Italy being... I'm sure Italy was fine during that time frame. The trains were running on time. Well, I think in the 30s, if you just follow two simple rules, you're safe. Be handsome and don't be poor. Oh, three rules for back in that tape. Be white. Be white. Yeah, that's true. That's very yeah. true. I like how they said Los Angeles, 1938, right before it started to go a little off the rails. I like how they said Los Angeles, 1938, and then it started with machine gun fire. I'm like, oh, the more things change, the more they don't. What do you know about women, Peeve? You hadn't had a date since 1932. Flora Maxwell. There was no point in dating nobody after her. What <laughs> with all the chlamydia she gave me. Yeah, it itched everywhere. Yeah, I wasn't the only one dating her. Turns out you could tell who she wasn't sleeping with by the guys who weren't scratching their crotch in town. Oh, those were the days. We're looking for a pilot by the name of uh, Cliff Secord. Oh, yeah, I know him. Short fella, gimpy leg. Didn't he move to Cincinnati? Cincinnati. <laughs> no one moves to Cincinnati. So romantic. I bet he's handsome. Oh, I wish he'd rescue me. <laughs> me too. Wait, what? <laughs> oh my god, is that Max Grodchek? I'm going to say yes because. That's Rom! That's Rom from Deep Space Nine! No shit! Oh my god, another Star Trek reference! Take a drink! What do you mean you found something? <laughs> it's an engine. Okay, but you strap it to your back and it makes you fly. Without wings. You're always saying you're the last to know. Cliff, I meant the important things. It's a rocket pack in the 30s. We don't even have those now in the 2020s. I'm irrationally upset about that. <laughs> the amount of brain damage this guy probably has by the end of this movie. Yes, <laughs> now we know why there wasn't a sequel. The Rocketeer 2 would have just been him in a psych ward drooling. <laughs> the Rocketeer 2. Concussions. <laughs> I felt something move inside me. I felt it tear loose and take flight. You said that to Greta Garbo, Napoleon's mistress. See, as a film major, I'd be really turned on by all that, too. Quote your movies to me, you studly man. No, I am your father. Oh, take me now! 
This thing's like strapping nitroglycerin to your back. I don't want to keep it. I, I just want to borrow it for a while. When you borrow something, you don't tell nobody. They call that stealing, you know. Shut up with you and your logic. So you're saying the guy next to him was, uh... He was in Blade Runner. In Blade Runner? Oh, yeah. hey, Tom, what's that make him? Uh... A, a returning friend to the podcast. No, that's not. Yeah, the word. but uh, how many? Th- that, but how? But but uh, how many times have we been on the podcast now? Now, now sh- 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 Jennifer Connelly is cleaning up her the front of her blouse. Come on, Tom, say it. Two Pete. <laughs> Damn it! Stand up, Taylong. How? 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 And they're all in Nazi uniforms. How? Well, they were hiding in the woods. Yeah, clearly nobody could see them, so nobody would know they were in Nazi uniforms. Also a giant blimp. <laughs> a giant Nazi blimp! How did we not see that? Howard Hughes kind of looks like Dennis Quaid from Independence Day, huh, Tom? Hello, boys! I'm back. Fuck you, Josh. <laughs> I keep forgetting that Dennis Quaid was in Independence Day. <laughs> Except that he wasn't. <laughs> I hate that Nazis ruined Zeppelins for everyone. Well, Hydrogen did that more than the Nazis. Hell, Hydrogen. <laughs> Don't laugh. Stop. That was, that, bro- that joke crashed and burned. Oh, the humanity. Yeah, it definitely bombed. <laughs> I'm keeping that in. It went down in flames. Okay, now he can stop. You're writing this joke into the ground. Also, I want to dress like a 1930s gangster. I just, I need to do that. You think if I dressed as a Neville Sinclair as a cosplay, anybody would get it? Uh, no. But I say do it anyways. And then I'll tell everybody at the party that Josh is dressed like a Nazi. (laughs) (laughs) And now... Back to the episode. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let me know when you guys are ready. Oh, I'm, I'm already clapping because uh, I'm yeah, already yeah, ready. Yeah. All right. So we just got done watching The Rocketeer 1991 cult classic. Is it a cult classic? Who cares? It was great. We had fun. Um, And we are going to do some final thoughts as usual. And we are going to start tonight with Josh, who uh, had the most reverence for this movie going in. So, Josh. Does it still hold up? I think I know the answer. <laughs> Dude, I don't even want to play. This mute movie is just pure brilliance. I love this movie. I had a blast watching it. I did look at my phone once, and I've seen this movie a thousand times. And it's just, it's got the pacing. It's got the acting. Freaking Timothy Dalton is a genius in this movie. I, I can't talk good about it enough it is a travesty that this movie did not make more money that it just wasn't revered in its time i mean granted Mm. 91 was an epic year but kid josh loved this movie and adult josh still loves this movie i have this is nothing near a guilty pleasure for me i if i need a feel-good movie if i need something i know will be entertaining every single time i watch it i will put this in and i will watch it Shit, after watching this movie this time, I wanted to go strap some plywood to my back and run around my backyard. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just, I still can't talk enough about this movie. We'll get into more late here in a minute, but Tom, I, I want to hear your thoughts. I've got a lot of thoughts on this one. I'm, I'm just trying to figure where to start, to be honest with you. First, yes, still a fun as hell movie. I know this back in the day, this was billed as a superhero movie. Because, you know, Batman and all that. But this wasn't at all a superhero movie. I don't think he was really a superhero at all through this. And I kind of like that. He was just the right guy in the wrong place at the right time. And it was great how they kept the character from... I'm trying to think of the word here. Not to Steve Rogers for a modern audience to put that into perspective. He wasn't noble, but he wasn't like 
too goofy like Star Lord. He wasn't like total man child. You 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 felt like you could get behind him. He when he was in trouble, you felt like he was in legitimate trouble. But he needed to use his wits to get out of it, not just the rocket pack. That wasn't just like the get out of any problem situation. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he had to be the guy who was clever, and I like that. I didn't catch that as a kid because I was too focused on zoomy zoomy rocket pack and punchy punchy and dodging bullets but this time i do love that i love how it's grounded the stakes aren't the end of the world if they lost the rocket pack that just means the nazis get it and it could make things more difficult but it's not like if they don't do this they're whatever is going to destroy the galaxy the stakes were if they lost they it would be terrible but it wouldn't be end of the world terrible so you felt like they could lose but it kept you invested even though you didn't you knew they weren't going to lose i'm tripping over my own thoughts there's just so much and i love this film i feel like a kid again the the nostalgia is coming out yes um josh to mirror your thought before i turn it over to dan yes um when he strapped on that helmet and just started flying around i also was like i i kind of i kind of want that costume I I want to zoom around like a kid. And on that note, I zoom it over to Dan. Nigel. Well, it's funny. Josh mentioned (laughs) that if he wants to watch a movie, a feel good movie or just a movie that he wants to watch that he can relax to and, and Mm -hmm. enjoy. um, He puts, he'll put on this movie. I have a movie that I like to watch when it's a feel, if I want to watch a feel good movie and an action film that makes it, I know the outcome and I've seen it a thousand times, but it just makes me feel warm inside. And that is Captain America, the first adventure. It was also oh. directed by Joe Johnson. Oh, I like how you brought that around. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. yeah. Like I love Captain America, the first adventure. I actually think the winter soldier is a better film, but the, the first adventure to me is a very good movie and a very good feel good movie. I know that it feel good in a sense, like, you know, a superhero movie, but it's a feel good movie. That has a great score, great action, great acting. All the characters are amazing. And this movie hits all those beats as well. And it was made 20 years before, you know, <laughs> so and, and that's kind of amazing that Josh mentioned that. At this, and I was actually going to not say the exact same thing. But as soon as Josh said, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Because I like the first Avenger for that feeling. And the Rocketeer is a really good movie in that scene. Hits all those same beats, too. You know, I, yeah, Tom, you said it when we were watching it that. Some of the special effects look dated. They definitely look like 1991 special effects. But you know what? Didn't take me out of the movie. And to add to that, too, it's like they didn't use them that much either. No, no, no. They, no. Was like, they had a lot of creative cuts in it. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, also directed by Joe Johnson. It's in that Captain America first Avenger feel. It's a feel-good movie. The characters are great. The action's fun. Um, the leads are personable and like you know you kind of relate to them you kind of understand them and i don't know i just i had so much fun watching this movie tonight i watched it two years ago when i first got disney plus because Mm -hmm. i you know i'm a verizon customer and they gave us disney plus with verizon so i tried disney plus and i think the one of the very first things i watched with disney plus after i got done watching a couple episodes of the simpsons was the rocketeer because i hadn't seen it in a while and it's Yeah, it's just such a feel good film. I just I love this movie that makes me feel young again. This movie really does make me feel like, you know, I I got excited. Yeah, Yeah, like like the scene where he's getting ready to put the rocket on for the first time and he's telling PV like, I'm scared out of my mind as it is. Shut up. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like I'm getting excited again because I'm like, oh, my God, the rocket is getting ready to show up. You know, it's like (laughs) I'm getting excited. Like I'm getting excited for the beats. And like I still get the chill up my spine and and I still get like I want to puff out my chest when he launches the rocket to go after the blimp and he's in front of the American flag and he's, you know. Like the mm-hmm. the music, the music swells up at just the right time and he hits the, the button on the rocket and he flies off and that American flag's all lit up and he's flying off to the Nazi blimp. And, and you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, USA. <laughs> you know, it's like when even the mafia is like, go get him, kid. Yeah, yeah. Even the mafia, the mafia and the FBI are fighting side by side because none of them are two bit Nazis. You know, it's like fucking amazing maybe it's cornball cheese maybe i'm watching it oh it's absolutely cornball cheese and i'm i'm I'm, I'm, maybe i'm watching it with nostalgia fueled goggles and i'm not seeing some of the flaws or some of the errors but then again maybe there aren't that many flaws and errors or maybe they cover them up so well that you don't really care 
So I can't say enough good about this movie. And now the three of us need to start discussing it together because I'm I, rambling. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the flaws are just I mean, this is a very basic like I wouldn't call it paint by numbers, but it is a very basic story. Guy finds rocket. Guy wants to impress girlfriend with girlfriend with rocket. But girlfriend is trying is trying to be Hollywood. So it, it, it's a very basic story. Uh, but that it so, hasn't. But doesn't it, need a lot of stuff to make it work. You, you know, that, what I was saying, remember when I was saying in during expectations, I was saying I want, I was expecting to see some pre MCU kind of like prototype vibes. This mm-hmm. movie, this movie has a similar vibe to a an MCU movie that would come out much later than this. Ant Man one. Yeah, Ant-Man, I can see that. He's not trying to impress his girlfriend in Ant Man one, but he's trying to impress his daughter, and he gets the suit and he wants to keep the suit for a little while in order to. Um, get out of whatever mess he's in to impress his daughter, to make his daughter's life a little bit better or get custody of her again and stuff like that. He's not trying to impress a girl, but it has some similar story beats. Not the same, but very similar. So well, he wasn't, he didn't really keep it to impress his girlfriend in this one. He did it. He wanted to keep it to make some money. Cause remember yeah. that was their big thing. It's like, maybe we can make more than $10 a show. That was the whole plot device was him telling her because of what happened with the, first uh, race plane is he wanted to tell her first and neville sinclair just happened to overhear it Mm -hmm. the plot was mostly about like detective work on the bad guy side of trying to uncover who the hell took the uh rocket because he heard him but they had the ghost creative camera edits to where she was right in front of uh cliff and Mm -hmm. couldn't see his face then he was rushing to find him um i'm sorry he was german but he was rushing to find him and uh (laughs) Boom. Get out. Get it. We're done. That's it for tonight's show, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure to listen to us on the, the whole thing was now oh, we got to do some detective work to discover them. And it's like, we're like, oh shit, they're, they're, the bad guys are, are closing in type thing while he's also becoming the rocketeer, you know? Because he didn't put on the thing initially. He wanted to put on the rocket pack the first time to, to do a show, but they hadn't gone that far in their planning. They were still testing. And then, like, his uh, friend was in danger and he's like, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. I liked how nothing was really wasted in terms of stories. It's like everything kind of dominoed a little bit. You know, she made a big deal about him not telling her that, you know, not coming to her when important things happen. So he came to her when an important thing happened. He had the rocket. But that led to Neville Sinclair hearing the conversation. He's like, hey, I have this rocket, which led to this, which led to that. Him eating the gum played into like oh shoot there's a bullet hole in this we need to fix it with something how about i use this gum you keep putting on everything there wasn't a lot of just things that they put in because it was cool it was like the batman suit in batman begins everything had a purpose even the ears which kind of leads me to my next point this felt a lot like batman begins to me in the sense that it made money but it was kind of a considered a disappointment A lot like this movie now. And it makes me just realize like if they had given this a second movie, like they gave, gave Batman begins, gave it a dark night, Mm -hmm. would it have done as well? And so I I don't know. I think I I honestly think, I honestly think that this movie was made today and did similar numbers. So even on the high end of this movie's production value, it only made like $6 million in profit. I think mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, it's like I think the high end was the budget I think I listed during the rundown was 35 to 40 million and the box office was 46.6 million. So at best it made 11 million, at worst it made 6. So yeah. um I think if this movie was made today with the backing of Disney and still did equivalent numbers today where it would probably have gotten an 80 to 100 million dollar budget and only made about let's say 10 to 15 million at the box mm. office, which would be a disappointment. I think it would have got a sequel. I still think yeah. it would have got a sequel. You know this movie was a hit on VHS rentals, and you know that they're... Because, yeah. I mean, they technically, and I hate to say this on uh, on the show, but technically it got a sequel in terms of a Disney Junior TV show. Did it? There is a Dis- I didn't even know that. There's a Disney Junior TV show called The Rocketeer, and I want to say that the guy who plays Cliff came out and actually reprises his role. But it's like an animated TV show. It's about a little girl who finds a rocket. Today I learned. But okay. I still think, I think if this movie was made today, it would have gotten a sequel. Mm-hmm. I just do. Just the backing of a major studio. Because I, I've seen movies that have like, you know, 
middling numbers now get sequels. And Tom actually mentioned Batman Begins, which did middling numbers. It wasn't as much of a dud as this one, but it mm-hmm. did middle numbers, and, and yet it got a sequel, and it got The Dark Knight, which a lot of people argue is the greatest, if not one of the best comic book movies ever. Nobody's arguing that, but The Batman Begins grossed almost $400 million worldwide. I always heard it, it was kind of a disappointment. Well, domestically, it had a budget of $150 million, but a domestic pull of $206 million. Yeah, Which, yeah. 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 So that that's like that- $56 million. I mean, so domestically, it didn't do that great, but it pulled in $166 million worldwide. Right. Yeah, so, but that was that time frame was like, well, international numbers don't count. Because I remember that we made that same comment about uh, Superman Returns. Like, it did grow globally, but domestically barely anything but we're, we're talking about movies that aren't rocketeer and i didn't mean yeah. to derail us like this no but, but let's I'm go just back saying, no, i'm just yeah, saying yeah. it would have got a sequel that was yeah. my point no, was, no, back it, was, to, it would have gotten a sequel yeah yeah but back uh, to like the, the movie here yes go ahead josh but yeah look, the rocketeer back to this one like seriously i think this movie is one of those instances it's like making a cake not even making a cake like making a what's something that you would bake that every single ingredient is amazing by themselves, but they're even better when you put them all together. Lasagna. We're going to say lasagna. It's a lasagna. I don't know. It's a food. It's something. You yeah. live- food, it's a, food, food allegory. Metaphor. Take a drink. Take a drink. Yeah, um, but basically, every single ingredient in this, I think the acting, the, the cast was superb. The um, directing was amazing. The um, music was just flawless. And it's oh, like the music. Absolutely. I, I will argue the directing, but I will agree 100 percent the music. Yes, the music was flawless, like directing. Um, If I had to critique, there was a couple of scenes where it did slow down a little bit. But overall, I think that yeah, overall, I would give it an A rating, maybe not an A plus, maybe an A minus, depending on how tired I am. But um, <laughs> the music A plus 100 percent guaranteed. Oh, yeah. Um, James Horner, right, Nigel? Yep, James Horner. May he rest yep. in peace. Another Star Trek guy. And it's like, but then you take all of these amazing ingredients and you put them together and you come out with this amazing cake or whatever food metaphor you want to choose. We're going to spend more time trying to figure out a food metaphor, but that's what this movie is like to me. It's like, I'm watching this movie tonight and I'm, <laughs> I still can't get over the fact that I've seen this movie probably a hundred times and I still get chills. Are they multiplying? Are you losing control? Every time. This is the one that I want. Woo-hoo-hoo. Thank oh, you, Josh. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, but yeah, James Horner, awesome movie. I think the directing, honestly, was it was good directing. Don't get me wrong. And it was the right amount of directing for this movie. Because that's the thing I noticed about the untouchables a lot of it seemed indulgent especially that first scene when you meet capone it's all like you can tell he was showing off this one there wasn't a lot of showing off going on it wasn't also like intense cg stuff or special effects for their time it didn't wow the audience but it got the job done it passed the class i would give it a b maybe a b plus personally See, that's one I, player that would disagree with you on i, I would look much. at the uh I don't look at the directing as just camera angles. Now, I'm no film major, but you got to take direct directing in <laughs> as uh, more than just like, because you can have an amazingly directed film in terms of like angles and shots and special, you know, trick shots, trick zooms and all that other good stuff. But the rest of the background and everything is an absolute shit. Like this movie, like felt like it was filmed in the 1930s. I always going back to my James Cameron um point james cameron's a great director not because his camera angles are good james cameron's a great director because of his attention to detail you may give his camera work a b you may but you can't give his attention to detail anything less than an a and i think that this guy joe johnston when he directed rocketeer and even captain america the first avenger like he does such a good job of maintaining the integrity across the board with all aspects of the direction. Like even look at honey, I shrunk the kids Mm. like the attention to detail and the atmosphere that he creates in his direction. I think about the opening scenes in honey, I shrunk the kids as it looks kind of campy. It looks kind of fake, but it fits with the feel of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Yeah. 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 And I think that like, looking at his direction for the rocketeer it's similar like i can understand your argument if you take like 
take bits and pieces of various aspects of it and then you grade it on that level. But I think overall, he's turning in a paper. It's going to be an A paper, but you know, some of his grammar needs work or maybe he could use, he has a couple run on sentences here and there, but overall it's still an A paper. I follow that. I follow that. Nigel, what about your opinions on the directing and such? Well, I kind of agree with Josh. I think there, there's a lot of attention to detail that he had in this uh, movie that I really enjoyed. And um, just, I don't know, just th- things like the Beeman's gum and mm-hmm. the um, uh, the way the build, the way the airplane hangers look like. Those look like 1930s airplane hangers, not 1990s airplane hangers, you know, like because they were smaller back then because planes were smaller back then. I don't know, like. A lot of it was sets, I know, so they could build it and make it look on their own and all that. But just, I don't know, there was just like a lot of it, a really good attention to detail that did make you feel like you were in 1938 Los Angeles and not a facsimile of 1938 Los Angeles. Yeah. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, an outskirts of 1938 Los Angeles, because yeah. Los Angeles was still a pretty big city back in those days. Yeah, but it wasn't what it is today, like, because they didn't build the highways until after World War II. So, like, it didn't have the freeway system. So, it was kind of like this desert oasis back then. Now, they did do clever stuff by like not having too many scenes within the city. Like they really only have the yeah. South Seas Club in the city. Yeah. And that's a set. You can clearly tell that that's a set and you know. <laughs> oh yes, so, yes, yes. Um, a good set though. Good yeah, it was, set. It was a good props set. The props department. Yes. Yeah. I would more lean towards agreeing with Josh that directing to me I I view directors more on just camera angles and in special zooms and stuff like that. I like attention to detail, pacing of the film, the direction they got out of the actors and actresses, which I thought they got pretty good performances out of everybody in this film. So oh, can't, yeah. you know, fault too much on that one. And so, yeah, I'm kind of leaning more towards Josh. So I'm not a film cinema file guy like you are. So I don't see the, the nitty gritty of all of it, but mm, you know, no, no, again, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm not saying he, I'm not raising my nose to any of him. I, He's he's not an honor student, but he's still passing the class pretty well. And that still even sounds a little disparaging. It's like you're not an honor student, but you're doing all right. No, no, Mr. Johnson, you did really good with this film. You were the right director for this right movie. I'm sorry you just were too soon. You should have got a sequel. You yeah. should have got oh my more gosh. love. Should've well, he technically, he technically did. Captain America, the first <laughs> Avenger, is kind of sort of a sequel to this film. And it's still getting shat on, which I don't understand, but we'll talk about that if we ever see that movie. Yeah. Because I have and a lot of And if we ever get to that, that movie, uh, Joe Johnston, you are more than welcome to come on our podcast and guest star that episode. Yeah, we would love to talk to you about this stuff. I'm and sure he's one of our listeners. He has to be. We love him. He is. I'm not going to accept no for an answer. But I've said all I can really say about this film. I'm kind of gushing over it now like a fanboy. So Yeah, yeah. And really, I'd just be like pointing out the catering at this point, too. So, yeah, I've said all I can say. Yep, yep, I have to agree. And that's it for tonight's show. So, as a reminder, you can find us on firepitpodcast.com. I never get tired of saying that website name. I love that. It's so cool. Over there at firepitpodcast.com, there are links to Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe to on whatever medium you choose. Uh, we really appreciate it. It helps us out. Leave a review if you can. Uh, if you leave a review, we'll show up on searches of uh, you know, uh, people ser- searching for Timothy Dalton films or 90s movies or The Rocketeer will show up on those searches so people can hear our uh, thoughts on these movies, whether we like them or not. And tonight we liked it. So uh, we're going to go with that. And if you want to continue gushing with us about this film that we <laughs> really like today, or if you have dissenting opinions, if you think we're morons for liking this, be sure to join our Discord channel as well and talk about it. Uh, the link to the Discord channel can be found in this episode's description at discord.me slash firepit. There you'll get notifications of new episodes and even better, engage in discussions with other fans of the show. You know, again, agreeing and or disagreeing with our opinions. So if you want to keep that conversation going, join the Discord and, you know, talk it out. And you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, just like that one dude in the interspersal keeps yammering on about. That sexy dude. Pretentious. You can like, you can also <laughs> like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter 
Our handle is at firepitcce. Both of them are linked in the episode's description as well. And be sure to send us in your questions for our Q&A session. Our Q&A session is going to be in a few weeks. Um, I think the episode goes live at the end of December. Uh, that's when we're going to be recording that episode. We record things a few or a little bit in advance, so we'll happily answer any questions that you may have, and we look forward to answering them and hearing from you guys. And if you send us an audio clip asking the question, we'll definitely play it. Uh, Asterix within reason. Yes. Well, yeah, we're not going to do I mean, everything. Yeah, yeah. Depending on what the audio it is. It will be vetted first. Yes. I shouldn't have to qualify that, but this is the internet. I need to qualify that. Most definitely. So, Nigel, any shout out? We will probably play yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like to give a shout out, of course, to Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Thank you very much for your continued support, listening, feedback, and uh telling me which uh, episodes you enjoyed uh, you when you listened to that week. And also a shout out to my wife. Uh, happy anniversary. Uh, as I've mentioned in every episode so far, I promised her I would give us a special shout out for our anniversary, but I was afraid that I would forget to shout out the actual week of our anniversary. So I just decided I'm going to shout out every episode we record in November. So uh, shout out to my wife for uh, in, on a happy anniversary. And also speaking of family shout outs, um, I would like to give a special shout out to my daughter. I will not give her name on air, but uh, she made the honor roll for the first time ever. So she has surpassed her father. Yeah, in school accolades. I never made the honor roll. <laughs> not until I got to college. I made the dean's list. So yeah, so yeah, my daughter made the honor roll. I was very proud. Um, proud papa moment there. Hey, she's doing better than her pseudo uncle over here too. So wow, kudos, yes. girl. And special shout out to Zencaster, our recording software. Once again, making life easy for the editor, which we like. Well, the two other hosts make life hard enough for the editor. So it's good that the software doesn't make life hard for the ed <laughs> editor. Lord knows um, I make it difficult. For yeah, the yeah. The, yeah, the chat the chat today was just like, uh, Dan's going to have to mute this channel for a minute because the director and the editor are, are going, uh, whose vision is what now? So, <laughs> but, uh, so shout out to Zencaster always, uh, making things easy for us just helps, uh, with the recording helps us make multiple recordings a night seamlessly. And we haven't lost one yet. Well, we've been using it for almost a year now, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. So, when, uh, was, I think uh, we started using it on, uh, our first episode we recorded was Hoosiers and that was recorded. Da -da 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 uh, yeah, 25. We recorded that around Christmas last year. So almost so a year. almost a year almost a year of using Zencaster and uh, we haven't had a hiccup with it yet whereas uh, Skype was cumbersome to use at best and difficult at worst so and we've uh, only had really one trouble with Zencaster but that wasn't Zencaster that was uh, the editor error so yeah. I'll I'll own up to that Zencaster it wasn't your fault that time yeah so I whoopsie daisy so shout out to Zencaster. And from my side, um, one, I would uh, like to shout out two of our followers, one from Facebook, Turner, and from Podbean, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your username, Visual Bailarov, both of which join the many and growing who either follow us on Facebook because they like us popping up on their feed, seeing what we post. Um, knowing that we're still going on and getting to brag to their friends that, hey, I'm Facebook friends with them. Or if Podbean, just pop in, listen to some of our earlier episodes, only stick around for the new episodes, or are trying to work your way through the 80 plus, soon to be 90 plus episodes by the time this comes out. Whichever it is, we appreciate you tuning in, popping in, and helping to keep the fire pits burning. And in terms of software, Audacity, I love you so much. Audacity is the software I use every day, week, month, and so far, almost two years and counting, to edit this podcast. Audacity is free, so I'm not paying at all to use them, but they are not paying me a single penny to say anything good about them. But considering everything they do for me, I have to shout them out. They help us make this podcast, so whether you want to make a podcast or 
music or just like hearing the sound of your own voice, it hasn't done wrong by us. I'm sure it will not do wrong by you. And I would like to shout out my uh, wife for allowing me to do multiple recording sessions. We're preparing for a vacation. So shout out to you guys too, Tom and Dan, for helping me not stress out about making sure we get this podcast done while I'm on vacation again. I'm not stressed out at all, he says, drinking his fifth cup of coffee before he has to go back to editing. <laughs> yeah. We got a backlog in. So, but uh, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, Tom's got a lot of work ahead of him, but uh, yeah. So thanks for greasing the wheels as it were. And yeah, shout out to uh, sync lounge and plex amazing pieces of software as always helping us uh, watch these movies together. That's, that's a short one, Tom. Well, <laughs> print that. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? You know what? I'm just dead tired of this. I'm I'm just going to you know, I'm gonna fly like a crow out of here. I'm I'm done. I'm flying like I'm done. I'm a murder. Yep, we got uh, that uh, Edgar Allan Poe mo- movie next week, right? Quoth the Raven, Nevermore. Can't rain all the time. I mean it's I'm trying to think of a Bruce Lee quote here, but I, I don't know much about Brandon Lee to really make that work. Um, yeah, well, do you know guys. a fun fact, though, about next week? What's that? Brandon Lee was also in our episode zero showdown in Little Tokyo. He was. He was oh. in Showdown in Little Tokyo. Like so uh, This will be our second film with him in it. So what would that make him, Tom? Yes. I'm not saying it. Say it. Say it. And thank you for joining in. Say Tim. it. Say it. A two Pete. Yes, he <laughs> said the word. He said the word. And until next week, I've been Dan. I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Fuck You Guys. <laughs> Curtain <laughs> Call Entertainment LLC. Stay safe out there. Okay, why are we out in the middle of this field? Oh, we're going to test the rocket pack proper this time. This is my idea, so don't screw it up. Okay, well, if it's your idea, let's get Tom strapped in. Oh, no, 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 no. He's quite drunk. I helped fill the rocket pack. (laughs) No, I'm not testing this. It's your turn. No, no, no. I have A, a crippling fear of heights, and B, I've got to run the equipment down here in order to- But I've been through two walls and a barn already. (sighs) You've already been through all that. What's the worst that can happen? So, you know, you're fine. Just off you go to the field with you. Be free. (sighs) Tom, you're quite useless right now, but thank you for that. Okay, how do I start this thing? Oh, I moved the trigger! It's on your right glove! Like this big red button? Yeah! Two clicks to start, three clicks to stop! That sounds confusing. Just hit the button! It didn't do anything! Three! Three clicks to start, Nigel! Duh! But wait, I thought it was two. Two, three, what's the big difference? <laughs> Oh, holy shit, it worked. He's going up instead of over. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> oh, he's, he's going. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He broke the light barrier. I think he's just dead. Oh, shit, he had my other beer. No.